Welcome back to the Nerdman channel. My channel is primarily about astrophotography and I do a lot of mono narrowband imaging, hence the reason why the narrowband. And yes, I use Olympus equipment for all of my broadband stuff and also my professional day-to-day -day career. Now, recently some new camera tech has kind of showed up on the horizon and I'm gonna to talk to you about it today because it's a four-thirds sensor and I use a lot of those sensors. Actually, I think all but one of my cameras is a four-thirds camera even my dedicated ones. All right, let's get into this. With the introduction of the OM-1, a lot of people, you know, some of the big experts out there, especially some of the big channels who have massive numbers of following, have said, and I might say quite incorrectly, that, ah, image sensors are as good as they're going to get. They're not going to get any better, okay? That's not true, okay? That is completely not true. Folks, there is so much room for improvement in this industry with these sensors. We could, I would say that given the technology that is on the horizon, that's being discussed, that I've seen in the patents, and I love reading patents, they just, the engineer in me, you know, part of me, just gets all warm and fuzzy when I read patents. Anyways, <laughs> the technology that's on the horizon, okay? I mean, we could see probably a five-stop improvement in high ISO performance just with the technology that's on the horizon. So let's get into this, all right? And first, we're gonna cover a couple of things. This, this, this video today is gonna be a bit of a slideshow, okay? So most sensor tech these days, it's not coming from Japan like most people would think it would be. And it's not coming from China either, okay? Actually, a lot of the patents that I'm seeing filed are coming from Israel, okay? And most of these patents are being driven by small companies that are starting up that want to get into the image sensor industry and they want to manufacture sensors for vehicles, okay? Some of these new vehicles today have 60 plus cameras on them. I know at work, we just tore a vehicle apart. It was a Ford Escape. There was 250 pounds of wire in that thing, by the way. <sighs> yeah, and three cameras, just, just three. It was kind of a stripped down model. But anyways, yeah, there's cameras everywhere in cars and people want to get into this industry. And so a lot of these new startups are kind of developing stuff towards that. And that's where most of the patents have come from these days. And of course, yes. These new image sensors have to be very sensitive at, and light at night, and they have to be able to tell depth and all sorts of crazy stuff, which is actually going to open up all sorts of computational stuff, maybe three-dimensional things like we've never seen before. Okay, folks, the days ahead of photography and videography, for that matter, they're going to be exciting. Okay, it's going to be pretty cool. So, and here's another thing, okay, most of this new tech comes out in smaller sensors first, okay? Typically, older sensors are bigger sensors, and that's because it takes a long time to tool the stuff up. You know, I'm a manufacturer myself. I own a small company that I work out of my garage. I know that, you know, bigger stuff takes longer to manufacture and design and produce because it's a lot more complicated. Even if it's the exact same product, which is scaling it up in size, it's gonna take longer to do, okay? It's always more expensive. Now, let's talk a little bit, okay, about exclusivity of sensors, okay? So the OM-1, which, you know, is a new camera that I just got, and I've been having lots of fun experimenting with this guy and comparing it to my other cameras. This sensor is actually not an exclusive sensor, all right? It's a publicly traded sensor. It's the IMX472, okay? Which many of you probably know if you watch my channel a lot. Olympus has always actually in the past, eh, about six or seven years has used the IMX270, which was a sensor that was built specifically for Olympus to their specs, okay? Now, this sensor here came out about a year ago, and yes, OM Systems, you know, Olympus probably designed that, but they didn't get the exclusivity deal, which is actually a good thing because it means that they're making more money off of it. It's not, a, it's not an exclusive sensor, so anybody can make a camera off of that thing, by the way. And it is a pretty cool sensor, all right? And I'll, I'll talk about it later, but here, let's get into this new sensor, okay? This sensor, it's a publicly traded sensor, okay? And by the way, most of your publicly traded sensors don't have as many cool features in them, okay? You know, typically they're more general and they're more broad because, you know, a company that's designing them 
wants them to appeal to a large audience and they also want to make them affordable. So this new sensor by GigaJot, it's a four thirds sensor. That's why I'm kind of interested in it because I do a lot of stuff with four thirds sensors. All my cameras are four thirds. All of my telescope cameras, except for one, are also four thirds. And that's because most of my telescopes work with that kind of size sensor the best. You know, and, and yeah. So that's kind of one of the reasons why this sensor, when it came up on the market, immediately caught my interest because it's a 40 megapixel sensor, which means it's 8K video capable, okay? And it's four thirds and it's got a lot of cool things about it. And the first thing that really caught my eye, of course, is the one of the things that they, they brag about the most is it's read noise level. It's read noise level is insanely low, okay? This guy right here, this is, this is the Sony IMX 472, it has a read noise at best of 0.97E, okay? Big number is bad here, okay? This new sensor, it's 0.35E, folks. That's insanely low. That is so low, in fact, that this new sensor can actually count individual photons of light. And that's because the photons of light are more than the read noise of the sensor itself, okay? We're generating more current from photons of light than we are from the sensor itself. You know, and that folks, by the way, it's just kind of an example of how far sensors have yet to go. A typical scientific camera with one electron read noise has a photon counting histogram that results in a photon error rate so high that reliable photon counting is not possible. When the read noise is reduced, the photons emerge from the noise and can be reliably counted. The photon number can be reliably resolved from a region of interest and even from individual pixels. Okay. Now, why does this interest me as an astrophotographer? In astrophotography, typically we do long exposures. And we do these long exposures so that we don't have to read the sensor so many times. Because the more times you read the sensor, the more that dark current becomes an issue, you know, from the, from the read noise of the sensor. But with these sensors that are coming out with such insanely low levels of read noise, what this means is that we can take shorter exposures. And that means that guiding issues are less of an issue, okay? And that also opens up something interesting. It means that we could do what's called lucky imaging or planetary type photography with deep sky objects. Rather than taking these long exposures of these objects, we could take thousands upon thousands upon thousands of short exposures and find all of the best images in there and then stack those. We wouldn't have a read noise pile up on us. All right. And what that is going to do essentially is it's going to open up the heavens in a way that will allow the average photographer to see better and get sharper and better images of space. Because right now the sky is kind of our limit as to how sharp of an image we can get. The atmospheric dispersion, that rippling effect that you see, kind of like when you're driving down a hot road. Okay, that mirage type effect that's in the sky all the time. And that basically blurs the image, okay? The image of the sky has a fixed resolution because of that, okay, based on where you are. You know, some places have less of an issue with this than others do. And with these new cameras that are coming out with these insanely low read noise levels, it means that we can do possibly more of these short exposures. Now, when is this gonna kind of kick into place? Uh, 0.35E, that's still not quite there. I think once we get down to maybe below 0.2 or 0.1E, that is where we're gonna start seeing this type of astrophotography come into being, all right? But here, let's talk about the other three big categories because there's four major aspects of a sensor that we look at when we're trying to determine whether or not it's good low light. Okay, read noise, of course, is one of them. We just talked about it a lot. The next one is the well capacity, okay? Now, the well capacity of this sensor is 20,000 photons of light, which doesn't seem like a huge amount, but it's actually a lot considering how small these pixels are. Sony's IMX 492 sensor, which is found in the 294mm, okay, ZWS 294mm. You can look it up and see its specs. I know that camera has a read noise of 1.2E, okay, so it's dramatically, it's four times more almost than this GigaJot sensor, okay? And its well depth, okay, is 14,000 photons of light, whereas this 
gigajot sensor is 20,000 photons of light. So yeah, the old image of the bigger the, the pixel, the more the well depth can be, that is being broken down by new technology in these newer sensors, okay? And, and part of that has to do with the fact that this is a stack sensor, which means that all the wiring is behind the photosites, and that means that those photosites can be bigger and they can therefore absorb more light and record a higher dynamic range image. And by the way, this is a 14-bit native sensor, this Gigajot sensor. The Sony IMX492 is a 12-bit sensor, okay? Now, the next thing, the next big criteria that we look at, of course, is the quantum efficiency. That's basically the percentage of photons of light that we put onto the sensor. What percentage of that is actually detected by the sensor? All right, this guy, it's quite good. It's, 90, it's 86%, okay? And around 90%, 95% is really about as good as we're ever gonna get with sensors. There's not much more room for development in this area, uh, except for maybe with a bear pattern, which I could talk about. That's gonna be another video, okay? But I know Tony Northrop out there th seems to think that this is the only way that sensors have gotten better over the years, and that's not true, okay? And quantum efficiency has had a major impact in the past, but it's really something that has already been kind of fully developed for the most part, all right? But yeah, this new sensor, 86% quantum efficiency, that's quite high. Now the Sony 492 is claimed to be around 90, 91%, but it kind of depends on who is doing that reading, okay? I've seen some guys say that it's 85%. I've seen a few others say that it was 75%. It probably depends on a few characteristics and f figures. You know, it would all depend on how those numbers were acquired. It would be interesting to see that. Now, and then of course there's the pixel size. Okay, so uh, pixel size, well depth, quantum efficiency, and read noise. Those are the four different things that we look at for whether or not a sensor is good for astrophotography. And why are astrophotography so insanely critical of sensors? That's because what we do is really hard, okay? We're, doing, we're dealing with not very much light. You know, the typical photo taken in the daytime, even taken in a room kind of with the lights low, you're dealing with tens of thousands of photons of light on the sensor, okay? We're dealing with hundreds of photons of light, you know? We are, <laughs> we really have it tough in astrophotography. And on top of that, we have these annoying stars in the picture that dump billions of photons of light onto a single pixel, okay? Because they're so stinking bright and they occupy one pixel and then they spill into all the other pixels and they get bigger and bigger, which of course makes your image look blurry. I can go on and on about that. But yeah, yeah, so this Gigajot, it's product number, if you wanna look it up here, it's GJO4122, okay? And the 41, I believe, is the number of millions of pixels. And the 22, I'm not sure what that stands for. Maybe it's this pixel size, okay? But yeah, it's a pretty interesting sensor. Now, would this show up in a camera, like a, a consumer camera? I don't really know. Okay, first off, it doesn't have phase detection in it, which is necessary for autofocus. So that's kind of one thing that I would say that that, was, that would be a technology that would need to be added into the sensor if we were to see it show up in some new camera, okay? Um, another thing that it would need is it would need to be a higher frame rate. This one is 30 frames per second. However, I think the reason why they designed it to be 30 frames per second is because the USB 3 interface that their actual manufactured camera works with it's kind of limited, like that's as fast as they can make it go. You know, the, it even says in the spec sheet that it's limited because of the USB 3, okay? So you could probably design this thing to go faster, okay? And most cameras today expect, a lot of manufacturers now, they expect a camera to go 120 frames per second, at least for the EVF, and then a bunch of other things. Video, of course, slow motion effects are really popular nowadays, and they are really cool looking too, by the way. But yeah, and of course this thing has very low dark current, the dynamic range in it's freaking huge. It's 95 decibels, that's gigantic, okay? Uh, the maximum SNR 
is 43, which the, the Sony sensor that I was talking about earlier, I think it was like 27 decibels, you know, so significantly lower. You know, this, these newer sensors are just really quite incredible, okay, what they're coming out with these days. And yes, it's available in mono and in color, quad bayer color matrix, you know, and yeah, there's just, <laughs> there's so much cool stuff coming out there. Will this show up in a consumer camera? I don't know. It, 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 a lot of it's on companies, whether or not they see this stuff as being something of interest. I know the GH6, which is not a Sony sensor. I don't know exactly who made it. I don't think they've talked about it, but I believe that was a sensor that came out of a company in Israel. Panasonic at one time owned a sensor development plant and they sold it, but it's now being, it's in Israel and it's, it's owned by somebody else. And they're probably working with them on that. But yeah, exciting things up ahead, folks. You know, don't think to yourself that, you know, sensors are not developing anymore. They are, in fact, getting way better and they still have a long ways to go before, you know, we cap out and reach the absolute max of image sensor technology. So I hope you enjoyed nerding out with me about this. I know I get so much, you know, I get a lot of enjoyment reading engineering papers about this kind of stuff. I don't know why. It's just fun. But yeah, hope you get some clear skies. I haven't had any in a long time. Tonight I'm actually going to have a clear night and it's 100% moon. Yeah. Galaxy season. I hate galaxy season. But have a good one, folks. Good night.